Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Erny. I'm a data scientist with Pivotal. Um, I'll be talking today about the integration, really, of products around how to build models at scale, um, specifically how to do that around the Internet of Things. So when we talk about the connected world, what that means, and how we can build models off of it. So it's really going to be a use case driven discussion about the things that have to be considered when building models, um, focused largely around the challenges with engineering those features, how to build models that help you drive some sort of an action, and how to gain insights from those. I sort of wanted for a show of hands to start off um, to sort of ask how many people in the room qualify themselves as data scientists of some sort, and how many people are um, completely new to this. Okay, good. Um, so Hopefully, um, if there is at any point something that's um, going a little bit too fast, maybe I'll see your eyes glaze over or someone could raise their hand if it's a little bit too crazy. Um, so I'm not going to focus too much on Pivotal itself. We have a booth if you want to go visit the booth. Um, we have a variety of sort of offerings. Um, specifically, what I'll talk about mostly is really on the data science side. So the data science team actually works with our customers. Those are the use cases I'll be talking about specifically in oil and gas pharma and healthcare provider space. Um, but what we do have is a suite of products. So we have um, basically at, at the base, everything is Hadoop. Um, we partner with Hortonworks there. And we also have a SQL engine called Hawk that sits on top of it. So most of what I'll be talking about today really is how we build models at scale on large volumes of data that's living inside of this um, environment. And um, if at any point after the talk you'd like to come up and talk to me a little bit more about the specifics, about how we write queries, how we write the code, I'd be happy to share those details with you. I'm going to keep it higher level for this particular talk. So first, it's nice to level set about Internet of Things and what we specifically mean about that. So in our day-to-day -day lives, uh, we have smart devices. Those devices generally talk to us, they collect information about us, and they give us feedback. So I have an iPhone, it tells me how far I've walked. Um, I, may uh, I might have sort of a Fitbit that's telling me how far I've walked, but doesn't necessarily communicate directly with my iPhone unless I've sort of set that up in a specific way. Um, of course, Nest, um, Google's acquisition, allows you to sort of know when to heat up your um, house to keep it at a good temperature. Um, and we have pretty smart cars like Tesla. Now, the problem is that we kind of have to be that center point to make good decisions about what we want to do. And in fact, there are people that are trying to make those decisions a little bit more automated. So what they want is for those devices to be talking to each other. So there's actually an individual. Um, he has a great Twitter handle, um, Visible Tesla. That's very fun to follow. What he's actually done is some really clever stuff. So for example, he has a Tesla. And he would like the Tesla, when it's parked at a Safeway, and he turns off the car, to send a text message to him saying, hey, looks like you're at Safeway, you're going shopping, why don't you grab your bag out of your trunk so you don't have to pay your 10 cents or save the environment. So really what you want are the devices to talk to each other to make good decisions for you. Um, if this and that is actually um, a long existing kind of framework for you to be able to have devices that maybe turn on the light when you get home, um, if you've been gone for a while because your phone leaves, it alerts your um, sort of system to shut things down. And then, of course, Google now with Weave um, is actually building ways for you to directly connect your devices, specifically to your phone. Um, so what we have is now a growing, really, um, ecosystem of us to be able to personally deal with um, how to make our devices talk to each other. But what we actually want um, are things that kind of make our lives easier in general. This slide is kind of giving you a view into what is actually already happening now. So there are, for example, refrigerators that detect when something's gone bad inside. Um, they might alert you that, you know, your, I don't know, broccoli has spoiled. Um, and it would be nice if it sent an alert to your phone when you show up next time at the grocery store, hey, why don't you buy some broccoli? Um, it, there are even devices that, for example, when your alarm clock goes off, it starts bringing your coffee. So really simple things that make our day-to-day -day lives easier. But really, we want to extend that much, much further. So it can really affect the entire world in the sense of we think about the Macondo disaster, how can we actually prevent something awful like this from occurring? So really, there are tons of sensors on any, on any rig that could have signaled, hey, there's something going wrong. Let's not allow this crazy spill to happen, explosion, and infect the environment for you know, decades to come. So how do we actually do that? Um, it, this exists pretty much in all parts of our world. So yeah, I talked about examples of things that we have in our pocket, cars that we drive that are smart. Um, and we have these really amazing fancy systems, um, you know, even on a jet plane, the engine itself has a lot of sensors. What if it could indicate up front, hey, there's something going wrong here? Um, so my background's actually in biomedical informatics. 
Um, although I started sort of a little bit more on the basic biology side, I've shifted over a little bit more into the medical space. And so for me, I'm also quite interested in how that can affect our healthcare, our healthcare delivery systems, and how we take better care of um, our patients. So today's talks that I'll go through, yes, I'll focus a little bit also on IoT um, in the oil and gas space, but then I'll transition pretty quickly over into the pharmaceutical space, specifically around vaccine manufacturing, um, and then talking actually about healthcare um, patient delivery systems. But the reality is that our entire world at this point is connected, and we would really like to be able to work on uh, systems throughout everything that you're seeing up here from you know, surveillance around what's happening in our day-to-day -day lives to keep us safer, to smart grids that are helping us save energy, or make sure that if you know, the power goes out, we, a bunch of us don't have to call, but we can kind of maybe even know in advance when something's starting to look like it's failing. I was instructed not to stand behind the lectern. All right, next slide, please. So really, just one quick sort of level set about what this all means. Um, in reality, when we are trying to build smart systems, so systems that are taking advantage of what's happening out in, in the space, so where you have a bunch of sensors that are collecting data, they need to send that data somewhere to a central, what we're gonna call brain. It's taking in all of that data, it's working with it, massaging it, and converting it into a signal, something that's gonna react. Now for us at Pivotal, we really have that that wasn't me back a slide. Um, what we have at the base is really a Hadoop distribution that allows you to absorb anything. So it doesn't matter what that data is. In reality, it's not just important to know what's happening in a smart grid. You care about the weather. You care about geospatial information. Maybe you care about text data that's coming in. You need some place to throw all that data in so you can work with all of the different components. Um, so we're gonna sort of start off just under the assumption that you're gonna put some platform in place that's gonna allow you to do this sort of thing. But what I'm gonna focus on instead is given that you have a place to store all this data, how are you gonna be able to process all that data to build a model and really go through this type of cycle really quickly where you decide what it is that you're wanting to have an application do. Maybe it's something like React when there's something going wrong with your oil well. How are you gonna build a problem around that? So how are you gonna formulate that as a machine learning problem that you can now address? Um, what parts of the data are you going to work with? How do you massage that data and go through this process? Iterate around, learn something from what you did, maybe make changes to the data you're collecting, certainly make changes to the underlying assumption of how you're operating your business. So really what that means is that we're going to be focusing on how to turn signal, so some sort of data. Here we're seeing something from an ECG machine. Um, it's a company called Alive Core. What they do is allow you to have an attachment to the back of your phone. Um, it's sort of measuring things about your heart health, in essence. It can detect atrial fibrillation. But to turn that signal, so something that's being collected from a sensor, and identify, hey, that there's actually, uh, next slide, that there's actually some sort of a signal here that we have to flag. And what's more, in the next slide, is that what we want to do is send an alert. There's something going wrong. I think you might have a problem. You should go see your physician before this becomes worse. You might be having a stroke. We should call an ambulance. So really, how do you take some signal that's there and turn it into an action that will then drive some sort of an outcome, improve our lives, um, in improve our sort of day-to-day um, -day operations, our business? So for the rest of the talk, what we're going to think about is um, how that data is collected. So along the way, when are you collecting this data, and when does it become actionable? Um, beyond that, sort of what's real signal, what's noise. So we'll go through some examples of how sensor data actually is quite noisy. And when you're working with sensor data, you have to turn it into an action. So you have to figure out what's noise, what's real. Uh, from that, how do you build a predictive model? So how do you make decisions? How do you decide what sort of the outcome is going to be? And how you massage that data to turn it into it? And when can you take action? So I can probably build a really accurate model about what I'm gonna say in the next second, given what I've already said. But, you know, three hours ago, could I have said that? Not quite sure. So again, I'm going to really take a use case driven approach. Um, and they might not all be in your domain, but hopefully they're done at a level um, that'll be engaging enough that you'll be able to think about how that applies to your own problems. So we'll start off with um, an oil drilling example, actually. So I don't know if you guys have ever thought about this, but, you know, how does an oil rig kind of go through the process of or the drill go through a process of you know, getting a hole so you can get a rig installed and start extracting some oil. Um, so that's gonna focus around how you actually build models at scale. So when you have billions of rows of data coming off sensors and things that are being combined with external data sets, how do you build that model? 
Next, we're going to go into vaccine manufacturing. I'm assuming everyone in this room has been vaccinated, so hopefully at least it's something that you'll think about. Um, and again, trade-offs here between when you can make an accurate prediction versus when it's going to make some sort of an effect on um, your product and your spend. Lastly, we'll talk about patient treatment. Um, specifically, this will be how to predict length of stay of a patient in a hospital. So given you show up to a hospital, um, you're having a heart attack, how long do I think you'll be in the hospital? And that's specifically going to drive back into the insight that we want to generate. Given that I know I can predict how long someone's going to be in the hospital when they arrive, does that mean that I can now go back and say, what were the drivers? And therefore, what changes can I make to my day to day in order to improve my outcomes? So let's start off with the oil drilling. So this is not a, a space that I was necessarily familiar with before starting at Pivotal, but it is a use case that um, we've worked on. So in the oil and gas industry, um, of course, they have a very lucrative business, but they also produce large amount of data. And the fact that it's now easier to store and process that data means that you can make some sort of additional value come out of that data sets, those data sets. So what are those opportunities there for data-driven approaches um, to actually improve operations, to improve something about the oil and gas business? Next slide, please. So let's talk about sort of two areas that we can think through. Um, there's sort of your day-to-day -day operations. How do you make things go better and faster? And then we'll look at the predictive maintenance side, kind of at a high level. We won't go through that one in quite as much detail, but it'll sort of, you'll, you'll think through, um, if you know something's about to go wrong, how do you predict it in advance and try and take corrective action? And that's, again, something that you could apply um, in potentially your own spaces. On the drilling operation side, um, one of the things that we're interested in when we're drilling holes in the ground is how quickly can we execute that. So there's this concept of rate of penetration, ROP. What they want to do is figure out how to shorten that time. So if I know, that if I can predict how quickly this drill will go into the earth, can I actually go back and say, how can I do a better job of making this happen faster next time around? What's nice about that is you'll be able to, A, figure out how quickly you can execute any type of job from here on out, but you might actually, if you start somewhere new, be able to come up with a smart way to start off, not just test a bunch of drill bits, test a bunch of pressure. So it turns out kind of how much pressure you apply to the drill bit, um, which of course you know, can have a negative outcome if you break it, um, kind of what the soil is that you're drilling into. Is it like very hard rock? Is it sandy? Um, and some other pieces around sort of the pitch all these are important in, in order for them to kind of execute and finish this job as quickly as possible. So we'll go through how you would go about taking a whole bunch of sensor data to then predict outcome. That'll then allow you to decide what you would optimize moving forward. On the predictive maintenance side, um, it's actually important to try and predict maintenance issues. So if there's going to be an equipment failure, that's pretty important. So it turns out that that's billions of dollars a year that are probably lost just in this space. And that's, you know, across the board, we've done this with IT as well. Can you predict when something's going to happen um, on the machine? Can you try and understand cluster events? Can you figure out who's best going to sort of execute on fixing a particular problem? Um, so really what we want are early warning systems, ways to say, hey, there's a signal here that normally says within the next hour there's going to be some sort of a failure. Um, or maybe understand what it was. So again, that earlier thing that I mentioned, if I know I'm about to predict a failure, then there might have been some signal upstream, and that might have actually been something that we did. It might have been an operator error that caused it. So if you do a root cause analysis in addition to a predictive model, how could you have sort of change going forward? Okay, hopefully those are like sufficiently exciting concepts. Um, but let's drill down one extra level here, no pun intended. So really any modeling process has multiple components to it. So again, we're putting aside the whole concept of how you're getting your data into your data lake, but still once it's all there, you have to integrate those data sets. You have to clean them, and you have to do that in sort of a timely fashion so that you'd be able to do anything reasonable with it. So once that data is all in one spot and cleaned up, what you're going to have to do is derive features. So if you think about sensor data, it's a whole bunch of transactions. So things are happening very, very quickly. I have billions of rows of data. But I need to kind of turn that into something to say, I predict in the next hour, given something that came before, features that I want to derive. So if I have all the information about a house, for example, and I want to predict how much it's going to sell for, yeah, I have a whole bunch of information. But how do I say, OK, it's the number of square feet. It's the number of bedrooms. Maybe it's the ratio of bedrooms to bathrooms. It's the zip code. Um, it's the you know, average price of the houses around me. How do I turn all of the data that I have into things that I can now put into an equation now, basically a solver that's going to say at the end in the modeling step, which we'll discuss, 
um, what the right answers are. How do I weight all of those individual features? So let's start off with the integration and cleansing piece. In the oil and gas space, as in most spaces, you're going to be collecting data from a variety of places. So some of those um, in the IoT space are going to be sensor data. And that's coming in very frequently. So in the instance of this use case that we were working with, we were talking about billions of rows of data. That's a lot of data sort of for one particular exercise of drilling. Um, and that's coming in at a very rapid rate. Um, so you can imagine there are things like um, the ROP, the RPMs, so the rotations per minute, and the weight on bits, how, how much weight I'm applying, essentially pressure, which should allow me to drill faster. So those kinds of things can then predict other outcomes. We also have operator collected data, and those are things that the actual person who's operating the drill or the people around it are collecting, and of course that's at a lesser cadence, so it's not maybe at the second interval, it's something that when something changes, so if a failure occurs, I indicate when the failure happened, I maybe give some details around it. There are a whole bunch of data integration challenges that I'm not necessarily gonna talk about um, around how you actually join various tables, that can be a little bit challenging. I'm happy to talk about that another time or offline. But instead, let's just take the simple example of um, we have, over time, uh, the ROP. So this is how that data is being collected by the sensors. We'll talk about the noisiness of data in a minute, but first we'll talk about the issue of here's something that's coming off of a sensor. We're going to get billions of rows here, just tons of indicators coming in. And then we have the operator who's actually collecting the data. There was a change in drill bit. I decided I would go from one drill bit to another because I thought that that would improve something. But that's being collected at a kind of different cadence. So you have to decide, how am I going to combine those data sets? This is kind of a simple concept, but it's something that you have to think about. Every time you're performing a join, various things, you're going to have to now apply that label to all of the data that comes later. So again, there'll be considerations around how you code this. Consider again that you have, just in one instance, billions of rows. Of course, now you have many, many different drill sites that you're doing this to. So that's the integration piece. Again, that's just one of many things that you have to consider when you're doing this sort of first initial step. On the cleansing side, that one's a little bit more fun um, in the sense that maybe it's something you haven't thought about too carefully. So here we have weight on bit. That actually turns out to be a slightly messier sensor. It doesn't capture the data quite, yeah, the, the sensor itself is quite noisy, so it's not capturing it quite accurately. There, has, there happens to be a little bit of noise, so a little bit of variation around what the real true weight that's being applied in a fixed way um, actually is. Some of that could actually be variations sort of where it's drilling through the, the surface and dropping very quickly, but um, it it's also kind of gives you the indication of what was being applied. Now let's look at this data. Um, I think most of us sort of in our brains can see that there's kind of a step function here. So we're saying that there's a lower weight on bit and then all of a sudden there's an increase. Presumably now we have to apply a little bit more pressure to get through that um, piece of rock. Okay, uh, that's interesting. I can see it, you can see it. A machine's not gonna see that. So if you decide, hey, I'm gonna take the average across uh, this particular group data set, just look at the average, look at how it splits. So really what we have is a bunch of noisy data here where even though we're applying the same weight on the bit, there are gonna be all of these outliers. The thing is, you don't necessarily wanna truncate it because an outlier could be real. Over here, there's probably, uh, it's gonna be hard for me to point out, there's probably something actually happening in that little peak on the green. There are a couple of them. Something might have gone wrong, might be an indicator of a failure, might not be data that we wanna throw out. So what do we do instead? Well, in this data set, actually what you probably wanna do um, is look across that window, split it this way, so you can see the difference between sort of the lower and the higher weight on the bit and you want to decide how are you going to clean that. First issue that we have to deal with, so if we're thinking about this sort of in a, you know, billions of rows kind of MapReduce framework, you have to make sure that you can order that data somehow because I actually think that if I look at my adjacent window, I can smooth that data out. So you might want to apply something like a median or a mean filter. In fact, what I did with this data set was specifically take a mean across you know, 10 plus or minus my particular second, and I remove the outliers. The maximum min is gonna be the assumption of an outlier. Um, you could do something like a median if you think about kind of the expense there, you'd have to reorder those particular windows, but in any case, you can see that the signal now is much, much cleaner. And you'd be able to test this sort of in a, sort of in our environment in the SQL engine, we do that quite rapidly. The nice thing is it's still continuing to capture some of those noisy spots that might actually be real signal. And there might still be some noise, so you might want to play around with it a little bit more. But hopefully that gives you a sense of kind of how you have to think through these problems. All of the data that comes in, you can't always trust it. You have to figure out how to massage it and to work with it. 
I know it's a lot, but we're gonna have to go through that next step. Um, so inevitably, I'm sure most of you have heard that 80% of the work in data science actually is around cleansing, this is why. So let's talk about one of the use cases that I mentioned. Um, we're interested in predicting failure. So there's gonna be a failure occurring. I happen to know that in this particular set of data, um, it's coming off of the same drill site, so we have weight on bit, uh, we have the, um, the bit position, rate of penetration, the RPMs, and you can see that actually at the end of this window, and these are all on the same time scale, there was a failure. Now, it's probably a little bit hard to see, and I know this is only one training example. A training example is where we know I can tell you in this window there is data that tells me that there's gonna be a failure right at the end here. And I have a lot of windows, not just from here, but from other data sets where there was no failure. So again, you and I might look at this data and see, hmm, that's interesting, there happens to be a lot of noise here and there, and there's something really crazy going on here. So actually, if we zoom in on one of these, maybe here on the bit position, there's some information. So you can see over time, um, there seems to be some sort of change occurring here. So we call variation is showing up. Again, if we smooth too much, we might lose that data. It's a little bit more obvious here, I think. Um, you can see that there sort of always are some outliers, but here what we're seeing is a little extreme. So what you want to do in feature engineering, so this is, again, we have all of this data, and we know that the failure occurs here. So what we might want to do is say, for any given moment in time, let's look back an hour, and in that previous hour, let's look at what the average RPMs were, let's look at the variation on those RPMs, maybe we'll take the ratios. This is the feature engineering step. How do you take the raw data and turn it into a number so that we say, you know, there's a lot of variation and a lot of variation is very predictive of a failure. So again, this is part of the feature engineering piece and we'll go through a couple more examples of that in the following two use cases. Uh, now let's switch to the last part, which is the modeling. Uh, next slide, please. So I gave you a couple examples um, and I'll actually throw a third one in there of um, modeling um, so how do you build predictive model? So there are multiple things here that we might be interested in doing. The last one we just talked about was predicting equipment failure. So in a future time window, can I predict that there's going to be some sort of a failure occur? Um, you might want to predict what the remaining life is of the equipment. The reason why that's interesting is if I know that there's enough for me to get to the bottom of this well or to, to drill this hole, then maybe I won't want to replace something. But if I know that the job can't be finished, I probably want to switch out that equipment before. Uh, so that remaining life might be important. And the rate of penetration we talked about, we'll go into a little bit more detail about how you build those models at scale, but uh, I just wanted to throw up there for you the differences between that. So the first one is what we call a classification problem. You have a binary outcome, failure, no failure at this time point. Look at the previous window. Um, and here's some algorithms that are available to you to be able to solve that kind of a problem. Um, the next one is sort of predicting how much is less, so the time to an event. Um, common in California to try to do that with earthquakes. Um, sometimes you do that with churn. Um, in biomedical sciences, you do that with survival analysis. So how long do I think these patients are going to survive if they're on this chemotherapeutic? In this instance, remaining life of equipment. Um, Cox proportional hazard will let you do that. Uh, last one, the rate of penetration. That's something that's a continuous outcome. At any moment, it's like how quickly am I driving on the freeway given you know, the type of surface that I'm on, um, the amount of pressure I'm applying, things like that. That's a continuous variable. It can be zero to whatever number on some uh, continuous time scale. So here are some examples of the ways that you can run those. Um, linear regression elastic net, which is a way to sort of penalize having a lot of features in there, and SVMs, um, although that one's a little bit tricky. Okay, last piece about this, I swear, but it's just sort of a high-level concept. Um, applies to everything. So we talked about a linear regression. That's where you have a continuous outcome. So how many people are familiar with linear regressions? Oh, good. I'm still going to go through it for everybody else in the room, but maybe I'll do it a little bit faster. Um, so in a linear regression, your assumption is that I have some correlation, essentially, but uh, what we're going to say is that there's specifically a dependent and independent variables. The dependent variable here is rate of penetration. That means I think that how quickly I'm going into the Earth depends on all of this other data. So all of these things are actually controlling that for me. And the way you generally do that, uh, maybe you remember from algebra way, way back in the day, you would have multiple equations where it said x times three equals y, x times two plus something else equals y, and then you end up solving it for the correct um, x's and y's. So you're basically solving a system of equations. 
Now, the issue is that when the training data exists, where Y is going to be how quickly we're drilling into the Earth and all the Xs, which are all the things I'm recording, we're saying that there's a relationship, a linear relationship. If I sum those up and I weight them correctly, I can now say what Y will be. Problem is, um, aside from the messy data, um, the, the world is incomplete. We don't have all the knowledge, so therefore we're going to have some noise here. And although our goal really is to be able to fit, sort of decide what these coefficients are, fit that so that across all of our data, we're going to predict that number. So in the future, if you give me that, I can tell you what Y will be. Uh, the reality is it's messy. So we're going to do our best. What we're going to do is actually figure out how to minimize, so how to pick these Cs so that across all of my data, the distance over all of them is sort of the smallest possible, the sum of squared errors. OK, that's fun um, and solvable, it turns out. So what we're going to do is solve this slightly scarier but still not so scary equation. Maybe it has two uh, variables that we're looking at. But each one of these essentially is a row in the table. Weight of penetration, weight on bit, um, RPMs. And we're saying there's a linear dependency here. Now, because we have to estimate those coefficients, turns out in linear algebra, there's a way to solve that closed form, which we're showing here. It's not as scary as it looks. You're basically taking all of the x's and multiplying them by themselves and adding those all up taking all the x's, meaning all of those things that I'm measuring about every single row, and multiplying them times that other variable. Don't worry about it too much, you're just doing this math. OK, it sounds fun. Uh, normally, the way that was done is I would do it on my laptop. I would load it all into memory. I would solve this math. Done deal. I have my c's. Doesn't work when you have millions of rows, um, potentially thousands of x's you know, for each row. It actually becomes kind of a challenge. But what's nice is anytime you're doing a sum of, that's what's called an embarrassingly parallel problem. That means you can solve everything separately. They don't need to talk to each other. And because of that, we can implement those algorithms in a space where we actually store here that uh, what we call a design matrix. So all of those measurements that we have that are coming off of the sensors, and for each row as well, the, the rate of penetration, you can split that up on your cluster. So each one of the subsets can kind of live on its own segment. Um, and we generally do this by storing it as a table in Hawk. So that's our SQL engine. It can be done, um, of course, just as a MapReduce job as well if you have it coded up. Um, and what you do is on each one separately now, you're going to run that particular subset of equation. What's also nice is by using the SQL engine, you're essentially saying, hey, I'm only going to load up each row into memory at a time, write it to disk, and it's going to be super fast. So in the time it takes you to scan the table, you have the result, and you're avoiding your memory problems. Um, of course, if you want to check out um, Spark, that's a way to keep it sort of in memory. But this is an instance where actually, because you're not iterating through that method over and over again, you're doing it once, there's actually no need to worry about that kind of a thing. Uh, what that means is you can do it really quickly, um, scales nicely with your segments. Um, here's a paper that was published. Um, Madlib is the, our open source machine learning library that runs on top of Postgres, um, Greenplum database, and Hawk, um, and I think Impala. Um, Cloudera team has made that happen as well. Um, it was written here um, with uh, Joe Hellerstein at Berkeley. So what we have um, essentially is this, plus uh, a large number of other machine learning algorithms that you can check out if you're interested. Um, a lot of the ones that I mentioned earlier are actually in this list. So I encourage you to take a look. But it's all open source, so you can look at the code. I only have, of course, 12 minutes. So <laughs> I'm going to skip the next slide. And next slide. Um, hopefully get through at least some of the vaccine potency prediction. So this next use case, um, vaccine manufacturing, we'll talk a little bit more about the trade-offs between model accuracy and timeliness. In pharma, there are tons of opportunities for data-driven work. Um, I've worked on um, sort of predicting new drug targets. Um, it can even be things in the marketing space, of course. Um, and this one was a manufacturing use case. So. It was an instance where we were working with a customer that has a very long process of producing, producing a vaccine. Um, vaccines are normally produced in a way that requires you to grow a lot of cells. Um, it's expensive. This one takes months. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that's being captured on the way. So you're doing some things manually, some things in an automated way. Um, and what it really is is a pipeline, just basically opportunities for you to capture data and figure out what you want to do with it. So we start off with some raw mixing materials. Maybe we take some pictures of what's happening in the little dishes on the way. Um, right now, a lot of manual counting of cells, for example, could be turned into an automated approach, um, which is something we've worked on in um, another instance. We also have a whole bunch of things where we're basically like, incubating a bunch of the cells. So we're putting them in a water bath. Um, it stays there for a period of time. I can report, record that period of time. I can record what the temperature was, changes in pressure, sensors, just tons of data. 
Um, and really, there are just a lot of opportunities along this line, especially because it's over six months, for you to say, hey, something went wrong. Either cut my losses, don't waste any more time or resources on this, or how do I take corrective action? So what I'll tell you is that when you build these kinds of data-driven models, not only will you learn how to figure out, okay, where can I intervene and stop, but also when can I actually make an adjustment to make a change that would have been more beneficial. So what we'll talk really quickly um, is sort of, we'll focus mostly on the right time to take action. Um, we'll talk at a very high level about the types of um, attributes, the features that you might want to engineer. Next slide, please. Um, so what we did was build this model that at this final level was predicting the true potency. Um, sort of you can see on the test set that we did quite well. Um, and what that means is that we have to consider, okay, I could probably predict very, very accurately the day before, even just off of a measurement, how potent this vaccine will be. That doesn't really do much for me. Um, what I need to know is earlier on what's going on. So yes, there are gonna be data integration challenges, obviously there are a multitude of sources here, but we wanna talk about first our feature building and then the modeling. So on the feature building, um, let's think about the sensor steps that I was talking about. Um, so even something like an incubation where I have some time and temperature, even the period of time that I'm incubating is important, that varies. Um, but think about the fact that the temperature itself could vary a little bit. The sensors are measuring temperature. Temperature, of course, is not perfectly fixed. You know, there's heat being applied, removed, et cetera. You might wanna look at the variance again. How much variance? And is that variance during this particular step influencing how good my vaccine is at the end? Um, maybe it's something like, um, centrifuge, which is basically where you're spinning it and you're pushing it down. Um, maybe it's how quickly I'm spinning it, maybe someone bumped the machine, something could have happened. There's some sensor data that's available for you to use. Now what's key is not just where and what I can derive. Some things are gonna be measurements, like the number of cells. That's more something where like, okay, I made a decision, it's something I looked at, it's something I decided to measure, and even though it correlates with outcome, I can't change it. It's still valuable, it might be a go-no-go no go decision. The thing is I have to decide when I'm looking at it, and I'm looking at it at day one, month one, month six. When do you make those decisions? So what you have to do is when you're building your models, make distinctions about which features you're going to include. Decide, okay, these make sense because it's at the time where I can still make a go-no-go no go decision, or it's too late in the process. Um, the other is if it's something like time of any particular process or your ability to change temperature, those are tunable. So make sure that you pay attention to what those particular attributes are. Um, only because I feel like we're giving a lot of information about uh, approaches that you guys might want to consider in your own tasks. Um, some of the models that you can use here um, for building a predictive here, um, turns out that potency, as you can see, is continuous. It falls on a line, it's not binary. Um, you can use one of these three algorithms um, as an example. And what's nice is for many of those algorithms, at the end, when you say, hey, I did a really good job predicting, you can also say, which of my features, which of the things that I extracted from my data set actually were very predictive. You can do that through a variety of techniques. So in our case, what we did, next slide, is actually go through and look for anything that we did. Um, it turned out it was really important the model. We built thousands of these features. Of course, we're not gonna necessarily go one by one and try and decide what's important because they might be important only with conjunction of, a, of other things. But you'd then definitely wanna go back and say, how important was this actually in my outcome? So um, something like an assay value, which could be a count of something. Um, if it occurs early on enough, and I can see here, it's actually quite correlated with my potency. Okay, maybe that's something I wanna measure and pay attention to early on in the process, if it, that's where it is. Um, in other instances, you have something that's a tunable parameter, so how long a particular step is, is something that I can set and decide to tune. Um, so in this instance, we actually found a way for them to improve the potency. Another key thing to really consider is that um, there are opportunities here for real-time feedback. So if something's changing, if your potency at some measurement is assayed too low, maybe you should increase that step. Um, there's also another piece where if there's anything that's being manually entered, you can detect that there was an error in this data entry piece and not clean up your data afterwards, but instead correct, um, sort of correct that earlier on. Okay. Um, so that was sort of that insights piece that I wanted to make sure that we talk about and sort of trade off with time and, and the considerations that you'll have to make um, in any model that you build about when and what you're going to derive your features from. Uh, the last one I want to talk about um, is how to derive insight from models. So um, we talked about it a little bit just now. I think it's a little abstract. It requires a lot of domain knowledge. But if we talk about a hospital, I think that's something that most of us can relate to and understand. So in the hospital, we have really tons of opportunities to look at 
how the Internet of Things can affect outcomes of our patients and improve what we're doing um, in an inpatient setting and maybe potentially elsewhere at some point. So we collect a lot of data about our patients. Um, it can be what's happening in a hospital setting with your medical history. It can be the medications you're taking. It can be lab values. It can also be all these much more complex things that we're starting to get now, like um, genomics data, so like your actual DNA and mutations, um, any sort of text data images. That's all there, and ultimately you can integrate it. Um, however, in this particular example, what we're going to talk about, um, there's sort of a series of use cases, but what we wanted to do in this instance, we're working with a hospital that had um, data that they were not really le leveraging because they couldn't take advantage of like the volume of the data. And they're also using really knowledge-driven approaches. As a physician, you know a lot about your patients. You might say, I know if their glucose level is high that they're going to have kind of a bad outcome. Turns out that's actually correlated with mortality, so death, um, if your glucose levels are high after um, surgery. That's good, but there are probably a lot of things that you haven't detected because you haven't mined your data. So we're trying to move them sort of more toward a data-driven approach. And then lastly, kind of how can you influence anything? In instances where it's not just a measurement, let's take a step back and look at what your hospital is doing. Um, is there something that we could have done there? So there are a bunch of examples here. Um, how do you prevent people from having to come to the emergency department? Um, that was a uh, use case that we did um, looking at asthmatic patients and their prescription refill history. Um, how do you make sure that they don't stay longer than they need to? How do you make sure you prevent someone from dying, essentially, um, and some other people pieces around readmissions? So in this use case, um, we have all this data. Again, we'll talk the, at a high level, think about the, the integration that has to happen. So you have the diagnoses, what you came in with. Um, you were diagnosed with heart disease. Um, we were, in this instance, dealing with patients coming with a heart attack to predict how long they were going to be in the hospital. Procedures, what you did to them in the hospital, lab values, monitor feeds, that could be your heart rate, um, temperature, for example, and orders, things that are kind of entered by a physician. Make sure to give them this mask, make sure to call me if something happens, um, and bed occupancy. So how many people are actually in your hospital, turns out, can have a large effect on the outcome of your patients. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail. We've talked about feature engineering a lot. But let's just think about it at a high level. Um, patients come in a lot of times, they're diagnosed with a lot of things. So actually, the times that you've come in, like how many times have you visited your uh, physician recently, are probably informative of, I might be kind of sick, or I've been in the hospital a lot lately, or I've been at long stays. Those things might actually be correlated or be drivers of predicting length of stay. Um, but really what we do is create a lot of these features by transforming a lot of the data. So can I see you know, how many people are in the hospital on average, um, day of the week, seasonality in terms of you know, what month of the year we're looking at as well. Um, let's try and look at other data that's not just about the patient, but about where they're sort of sitting. Um, and really what we spend a lot of time on is testing a lot of these hypotheses. So generating as many of these features as possible and then running tests. Is there a difference between length of stay of patients that have this or that? Is there a correlation between you know, blood glucose level and length of stay? Um, now, in this particular instance, um, what we did was actually build a model and improve the fit to sort of predict how long a patient would be in the hospital sort of within the next day or so. Um, but what we act actually afterwards did was say, okay, let's break it down by these different regions and say, you know, given that this is how well our model performs, so the accuracy, if we remove things related to the hospital, we observe a drop, meaning that the hospital itself is quite important. You can see it's actually more important than patient demographics. So those kinds of insights of saying, hey, okay, in this particular instance, that might not be true for all conditions, you might want to pay attention. So what kind of insights can you get from your data? Remove those features that you created and ask what impact it had on your model. Now, one of the things that was interesting, because I think the insights around hospital was kind of an interesting one. Um, we dug a little bit deeper into that to try and understand, because we use things like time of day that you showed up and time of day that you left. Um, it turns out that here we see, um, for this particular patient population, um, given the hour of the day, how many patients were admitted across. We, we did separate it by day of the week, for example. Um, again, ways to sort of test around the hypothesis, but overall, we see sort of this distribution from midnight to midnight. Most of the people sort of show up afternoon. Um, that's not expected, that's not uh, unexpected or, un or surprising. That's something that's been published in the literature. But this other thing is kind of interesting because that's fully under the hospital's control. Um, it was time of the day, so again, midnight to midnight, and the number of people that were discharged that were told to leave the hospital. So we understand you're not going to discharge someone at 2 a.m., get out, we're done with you. But this peak doesn't actually make too much sense because it turns out this is their nurse shift change. So what's going to happen right before the nurse shift change is they hold everything, 
We're not gonna discharge anybody for the next hour. We're gonna talk to each other. And now we're creating this enormous bottleneck of patients that have to all be discharged at the same time. So while that is a bottleneck on the nursing side, the ambulance that might be transporting you, it's not relevant to them. The people that are now signing documents, those are now new bottlenecks that we've created artificially. And so you might actually wanna go back and take that into consideration. I am totally out of time, so I'm gonna jump through these slides, but I encourage you to uh, think about how kind of connected devices can help us monitor people outside of the patient setting. Um, sort of wearables, tracking other devices, how that can influence things and check out our blogs, our data science blogs, that give you some more of these use cases and places for you to kind of think through your own problems and of course stop by our booth um, to ask us any more questions that you might have or come up and ask me some questions now. Thank you. <laughs>